So let's talk for a minute about illusions, specifically optical illusions. Have you ever seen the picture? If I was a little more tech savvy, you'd be seeing it now, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> the picture that you can either see a vase in the middle or two faces looking at each other. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Depending on your perception, depending on how you're looking at it, you see one or the other. How about the magic eye posters? Who remembers those? I loved those. Those were so much fun, right? Those were so popular in the 90s, and I was just really super young then. But I remember them, and <laughs> they, on the surface, it would just look like a bunch of maybe a bunch of red dots or some blue and green circles or all color lines. But if you relaxed your eyes and stared at them for a while, a picture would pop up like dolphins swimming or a flock of birds. And if someone gave you a clue, I can remember, actually I was in college when these were popular, so my college roommate would always be like, it's the birds, Elizabeth, it's birds. And I'd be like, I can't see it, I can't see it. So it's much easier to see, though, if somebody tells you what you're looking for. If you've ever tried any of those things, it's hard to switch from one perception to the other. And sometimes once you see, in youth ministry, my professor had... Um, a picture that if you looked at it the right way, you could see Jesus. I could never. I had him for like five classes. I never saw Jesus. But apparently once you saw Jesus in the picture, you could never go back to seeing it the other way. So sometimes you can't, once your perception has changed or moved, you can't see it a different way. Um, we think about what we, we see first, what we think we're going to see. And sometimes it's hard to see both things at the same time. So all of us at one time or another have operated on this basis of preconceived ideas of seeing what we're expecting to see or what we want to see. Has there been a time when you had a preconceived idea about something that you were looking forward to, like a gift or a special event, and it didn't turn out like you were thinking, right? Um, what happened if what you envisioned was going to happen didn't? Or you were surprised by something different than what you expected? The religious leaders in Jesus' day were called scribes and Pharisees, and they were the very best scholars. But they were also the ones who found it most difficult to grasp Jesus' message because they had a preconceived idea of what and who their Savior would be. Jesus wasn't what they were looking for, so they didn't understand him, and they missed his message. Sometimes we can have preconceived ideas about Jesus that make it difficult for us to really hear what he's saying. Jesus often spoke about the kingdom of God, and this is one topic where our preconceived ideas make it difficult for us to really hear and understand what Jesus says. When you hear the kingdom of God, what comes to mind? What are you thinking about? Is it a place? Is it a concept? Is it a vision of the future? Is it a way of living? You may be surprised by something that you're not expecting. So um, in his book, Surprised by Hope, it was written by N.T. Wright, who is an Anglican bishop, I love this book. I highly recommend it. It's excellent. But he says, The kingdom of God and the preaching of Jesus refers not to a post-mortem destiny, not to our escape from this world into another, but to God's sovereign rule coming on earth as it is in heaven. It's a picture of present reality, the heavenly dimension of our present life. The kingdom of God in the Bible is not a future destiny, but the other hidden dimension of our ordinary life. It's God's dimension. Because Jesus knew that the concept of the kingdom of God would be difficult for mere mortals to understand, he told stories. As we heard from Miss Sherry, he called these stories parables. And this was to help people get past their preconceived ideas and truly grasp his message. Each of Jesus' parables communicated something about the kingdom of God. So over the next several weeks, we are going to look at several of Jesus' parables and stories which offer different insights into the kingdom of God. 
today we're looking at one of Jesus' stories that has been told, relayed to us by his disciple Matthew. So I'll be sharing from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and I'm using the message translation. At about the same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. And he used the boat as a pulpit. He addressed the congregation, telling stories. What do you make of this, Jesus said. A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and birds ate it. Some fell on the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but it didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds, and as it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on the good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? The disciples came up up and asked, why do you tell stories? Jesus replied, you have been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart for this, the insights and understandings flow freely. But if there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. That's why I tell stories, to create readiness, to nudge the people toward receptive insight. In their present state, they can stare till doomsday and not see it. Listen till they're blue in the face and not get it. I don't want Isaiah's forecast repeated all over again. Your eyes are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see a thing. The people are blockheads. They stick their fingers in their ears so they won't listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look, so they won't have to deal with me face to face and let me heal them. But you have God-blessed eyes, eyes that see, and God-blessed ears, ears that hear. A lot of people, prophets and humble believers among them, would have given anything to see what you're seeing and hear what you're hearing, but never had the chance. Study the story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel, this is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there's no soil of character. So when the emotions wear off and difficulty arrives, there's nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, but weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle out what was heard, and nothing comes of it. The seed cast on the good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dream. So this is a great place to start because this is the first time Jesus tells a story like this. And we not only have the parable itself, but also the conversation Jesus had with his disciples about why he tells stories in the first place. Jesus spoke in parables to give people a different perspective. While he talked about something with which his audience would have been familiar, planting seeds, the story always had a twist. So parables are like brain teasers, making the people who hear them question their preconceived ideas and encouraging them to start thinking in a new way, to open them up to this new vision of reality. Jesus taught in parables because the newness of his message called for a new form of communication. Jesus had been involved in several conflicts leading up to today's story. The religious leaders were plotting to destroy him. His own family had been upset with him. And by the end of the chapter, he will be rejected in his hometown. Why is Jesus encountering so much hostility? Why do so many disregard his message and discredit his ministry? Because Jesus' words and actions were not what the people were expecting from a Messiah, from the person they thought God was sending to save them. So they rejected him. In the parable of the sower, Jesus focused on the surprisingly abundant harvest despite initial threats a result which was wholly due to the mysterious, 
concealed working of God who miraculously brings the harvest. Jesus is teaching from a boat, but his message is about the earth, images of seeds and soil. The parable of the sower is unusual in that Jesus offers a symbolic interpretation of it to his disciples. So after they ask, why are you telling the story? He explains the story. And the interpretation focuses on reception of the seeds by various kinds of soil as a symbol for the varying responses to the news of the kingdom of God. Jesus offers a clear explanation of what each element in the parable represents. But in doing so, he raises some troubling questions. Who's the good soil? Since soil cannot change itself, is there hope for the hardened, rocky, and thorny soil? Or are these destined to be unproductive forever? Many people in other parts of Matthew's story hear the news of the kingdom and don't understand, including the religious leaders who are antagonistic to Jesus' ministry from the beginning. The crowds responded positively to Jesus at first, especially when he was healing people, but in the end they turn against Jesus and call for his crucifixion, which leaves us to wonder if they ever really understood it all. What about the good soil? Who are those who hear the news of the kingdom, understand it, and bear fruit? Who are the ones who yield the abundant harvest? In other parts of Matthew's story, it seems that they are the least likely ones. Jesus tells the chief priests and the elders that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will go into the kingdom of God ahead of them. What about his disciples? Do you think they'll bear fruit? Later in Matthew's story, after telling several more parables, Jesus asked them, have you understood all this? And they confidently answer, yes. Yet subsequent events reveal how little they truly understand and how quickly they will desert Jesus to save their own skin. What is remarkable is that in spite of these failings, Jesus never gives up on his disciples. He continues to invest in them, even to the point of entrusting them with the future mission of the kingdom of God. Jesus calls Peter the rock upon which he will build his church, even though Peter's understanding of what it means that Jesus is the Savior is confused at best. Although Jesus knows full well in the end that all of the disciples will desert him, that Peter will deny him, he promises them, even knowing all that, he promises them, after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Matthew's story gives us little reason to have confidence in the disciples, except for Jesus' promises. Jesus does meet them in Galilee, as promised. And with all authority on heaven and on earth, he turns these disciples loose and entrusts them with sharing his mission with the world. So circling back to the parable of the sower. The main character of the parable, of course, is the farmer who scatters his seed carelessly, recklessly, seeming to waste a lot of the seed on the ground that holds little promise for a fruitful harvest. Jesus' investment in his disciples, it's kind of the same thing, right? They don't look very promising, but Jesus invests everything in them. Jesus squanders his time with tax collectors and sinners, with lepers and demon-possessed and all manner of outcasts. And he promises that his extravagant sowing will produce an abundant harvest. It's not difficult to find contemporary examples of the various responses to the news of the kingdom depicted by Jesus in the parable. Having the word choked out by the cares of the world and the lure of wealth Probably sounds familiar to a lot of us, right? 
But we have to be careful to avoid equating various types of soil with a particular person or group. And we also have to be careful if we think so much of ourselves that we think we're the good soil as a person or as a community. Because if we're honest, we can probably find evidence of all different kinds of soil in each of our own lives on any given day. Jesus does not use this parable to command people to be good soil, as if we could make that happen on our own. If there is any hope for the unproductive soil, it's that the sower keeps sowing extravagantly even in the least promising places. Jesus' investment in his disciples shows that he will not give up on them, no matter how many times they fail. And we trust that Jesus will not give up on us. We will keep on working wherever the soil is hardened or rocky or thorning within or among us. Another disciple of Jesus, Luke, writes of Jesus responding to a question from religious leaders about the kingdom of God. They were asking, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus was explaining to the Pharisees of that generation that in spite of their meticulous efforts, their mistaken understanding would not, not let them identify the Messiah's coming. After telling the Pharisees that they wouldn't be able to observe the kingdom of God coming in the way they anticipated, he also told them the kingdom of God is within you. We are welcomed into the kingdom of God when we commit our lives to God and when we accept God's grace and God's unconditional love. When our primary allegiance is transferred from all the kingdoms of the world to the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, giving us the ability to embody God's kingdom even though we are still human with human weakness. Like the disciples, we mess up. We don't always get it right, right? But Jesus still trusts us with his mission. We might consider the implications of this parable for us as hearers and bearers of the kingdom of God, for how we engage with the world around us. We like to play it safe, right? We like to sow the word. We like to share Jesus and share God's love places where we know it's going to be well received and where those who receive it are likely to become a contributing member of our community. In the name of stewardship, we hold on tightly to our resources, wanting to make sure nothing is wasted. We stifle creativity and energy for mission, resisting new ideas because we're afraid they just won't work as though mistakes or failure are to be avoided at all costs. But Jesus' mission was the exact opposite of that. Jesus gives us the freedom to take risks for the sake of the gospel. He endorses extravagant generosity and sowing the news of the kingdom of God even in perilous places. Though we may wonder about the wisdom and efficiency of his methods, Jesus promises that the end result doesn't rely on us alone. God will be working through us, which ensures a miraculously abundant harvest. Let us pray.